DeFi, decentralized finance. This is one of the use cases for blockchain technology that excites me the most. As you'll see as I'm going through this video, this is something that I am extremely optimistic about. It's one of those things, the more I read about it, the more I'm like, wow, this should be a thing. I'm glad that someone was smart enough to think of this. De DeFi is going to disrupt literally trillions of dollars in the financial industries. Now, there was someone who was commenting the other day who said, why are you always talking in terms of trillions when, when you're bringing up blockchain and disruption and things like that? When it comes to DeFi, trillion, like a trillion dollars is actually on the low side of disruption here. You'll see what I mean. The industries, this thing, this, this concept will disrupt in the long run. Now, DeFi, this isn't like one individual crypto. There are many different cryptocurrencies that address these various issues. This is just a general overview of what DeFi is, use cases for it, and why it's an extremely exciting technology. So let's just go ahead and hop into the breakdown here and without wasting any more time. So in order to explain this, of course, I have made a flow chart and you'll be happy to know, you'll be very happy to know that I've gotten much better at this new new software that I downloaded for, uh, for, for all things flow chart and this mind mapping that I've been doing. I'm getting a little bit better at it. It's still pretty chaotic, but I'm getting better. So let's start off here. What is DeFi or decentralized finance? Decentralized finance. So DeFi is a blockchain-based financial system that does not rely on any centralized financial institutions for its operation. It's an entirely new financial system that is open to anyone around the globe. That's, that's, that's a foreshadowing right there. Around the globe that doesn't require trusting big banks or big services with our financial system. Also, if you want to download this and all my other flow charts and nonsense that I come up with, make sure you join the Patreon. I've been receiving a lot of messages from people who are like, why is the Patreon full? It's because we do limited runs and then the spots run out quickly and then we have to wait a little bit, make sure everyone's settled and then open additional runs. So just make sure if there's spots open, get your spot before it's closed again. So starting off here, ignore Oprah. You'll know more about her in a second here. In order to explain, in order to explain DeFi, we first want to break down what is blockchain technology. So we're going to explain what blockchain technology is, the, the inner workings of that. It's very interesting. And then we're going to explain how DeFi works within the blockchain how that will disrupt industries and use cases for it. So we're going to start with the basics here. So blockchains have a public ledger, a, basically a public list of all transactions. It's a list that shows, like I have written here, Tim paid Jimothy, Pam paid spam. You can look that up, you can verify it. And these blockchain ledgers, this public list of transactions is accessible by anyone per yo. Yopra? Oprah. What is going on with me? <laughs> per Oprah, you get a ledger. All right. To understand a ledger, you must first look at the individual blocks within a blockchain. There are actually blocks within the blockchain and there's, there's chains too. Okay. So here is a block. Each block contains these three things, a hash, hash data, and the hash of the previous block. So here's the block. Here's the chain. Here's another block. I made those myself. I'm getting better at this program. So, so here's some more definitions. A hash is the unique string of letters that identify the block. You can think of it as a name tag for each individual block. The data within the block are the contents of the block. And this can be many different things depending on the cryptocurrency. It could be user data, real world data, dollar amounts. In, for example, Bitcoin's data within the block includes three things sender info, receiver info, and the amount of money transacted. So it's fairly simple with those three things. And then we have the hash of the previous block that is also stored in each block. So that is the name tag of the block that preceded it. Now let's talk about how this is secure. Why is the blockchain secure and perfect for financial transactions? And this is because if a block is tampered with, the hash changes. That name tag that is stamped outside of the block changes. And because the next block contains the hash of the current block, you know, each block contains the hash of the block before it, the tampered with block becomes invalid, which causes this chain reaction. And everyone can tell, hey, there's something going on with block 248, or three alpha Z, Z. And then in order to compromise the system, you would have to tamper with all blocks simultaneously. And this is near impossible 
in most cases, for the case of Bitcoin, it's impossible because one block is created every 10 minutes. So it simply is not feasible. That's why it's extremely secure. So the network is secure, but here's where it gets interesting. We can actually put apps called dApps, decentralized apps, and this is where I ran out of space, contracts on blockchains. So Bitcoin is fairly simple. It's just a transaction, but other cryptocurrencies that are more general use, like Ethereum, Cardano, allow you to build applications on top of the blockchains. This is, this is DeFi, this is smart contracts, this is where things get extremely exciting. So here's a nice light bulb, and this is where, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me, this is where we can actually remove middlemen and disrupt industries like finance. And this leads us to the question, what can DeFi do for you? And we're going to go into some use cases, starting with lending, just basic lending. So here's how it works right now, but it likely won't in the future, at least in the long run. In the old system, you give the, the bank your money. It sits in their coffers, it sits there, and then they lend that money out to someone else and they charge an interest rate. So they get paid back principal and interest. They take their, their, the money that gets paid back to them. They pay things like their employees for their buildings. They pay for the fact that they have a skyscraper in every single metro area, like Wells Fargo and Chase and these other huge banks do. And they take their profits and then they pay you back a measly 0.001% interest as a, hey, thanks for uh, putting your money in our bank and letting us make money off of your money. And we keep it safe with our FDIC insured accounts. But here is the new method. You have investors who pay money into smart contracts in order to lend that money out. And if you don't know what a smart contract is, I'll have a video pinned above that dives in deep as to what exactly smart contracts are. You should watch that first and then come back to this video if you don't know what smart contracts are. So you, you have investors who pay money into smart contract. That smart contract then pays money to someone who is looking to lend money to grow their business, to buy a car, for whatever, and there's a predetermined set interest rate. That person pays money back into the smart contract, the investor gets paid, everyone comes out happier except the bank. The investor gets a higher return, the person pays a lower interest rate, there's less friction, everything is better. This already is trillion dollar disruption. So let's do another use case. Or insurance. You might have heard me talk about this example before. You can see this looks kind of similar. The old, the old version, you have a bunch of people who pay premiums into this big old established insurance company because they, they want to hedge against an unlikely event happening. You have 100 people who pay a premium to the insurance company to ensure, hey, if my house burns down, I'm going to be paid and I'm going to be made whole for that unlikely event. The insurance company takes that money puts it in their pool of money, and this is called their insurance float. They use that float to make investments, they use that float to pay out the unlucky individuals who do have their house burned down who, or who do get into a car accident. And then the difference between the amount of money they collect and the amount they have to pay out is their profit. They use that profit to pay for employees, for their buildings, for their administrative costs, and then take out their end net income at the end of the day. And uh, everyone's happy. You paid into the insurance, your house burned down, you got paid, the insurance company still made a profit, they went home, but there's friction here that, that doesn't need to be here. And then we have the new way. In this system, you have individuals paying into a smart contract and you have insurance investors. If an individual has their house burned down, that smart contract pulls some real world data, pays that individual, and then the investors hopefully receive a return, all automatically with less friction, less cost. This should result in lower insurance costs and higher returns for the insurance investors. Now let's go through another example here. Or we have an exchange. Now this could be for cryptocurrencies like Coinbase, or it could be a stock exchange, a stock brokerage like Charles Schwab or Webull, which is linked down below where you can grab two free stocks, or KuCoin, which is also linked down below and you can save money on your trading fees with cryptocurrencies. But the reason why these exchanges make so much money is because they take your money and they make profit off of each and every transaction. And for someone like Coinbase, if you go and check out their financials, they are making a ton of profit. So in the old way, you pay money to the exchange to facilitate the exchange of assets. They take their cut, 
they facilitate the exchange. In the new way, all you need are the two people involved, the person who wants to buy the stock or the cryptocurrency and the person who owns the stock or the cryptocurrency. And you just need a smart contract in the middle to facilitate the deal. And it is much cheaper. Now, this is something that's already done. This DeFi exchange these decentralized exchanges are already done. There are exchanges on the Ethereum network and there will soon be exchanges on the Cardano network. This is something I'm very excited about and I plan on doing far more research on these decentralized exchanges because it just makes so much sense. And let's do one final use case. All right, you can see all of these look the same where there's this big institution who has just been reaping the profits as a middleman. And that's just friction that doesn't necessarily need to be there. So this one is a credit card company. So in this case, you know, the situation is slightly different where the credit card company issues you a credit line with this credit card, you use that credit card to pay for goods or services. That company who accepts the credit card, takes the card, slides it, charges whatever the amount is, and then pays something like 3.4% to the credit card company who gets paid this huge chunk to hold the credit risk and facilitate the transaction. Now, again, this doesn't need to be the case because you could have a simple smart contract that is far cheaper and there's no middleman. It is perfectly executable right in the middle. All of these industries could and will be disrupted with smart contracts. Now you can think of a million reasons and a million ways that something like this could fail. These systems are not perfect right now. They are absolutely not perfect right now, but you can see that this is something that makes sense in the long run. Now let's talk about some risks. First off is just simply bugs. Any vulnerability or bug in a smart contract code or in any DeFi code holds the potential to big problems. Of course, this is also the case with using any website. If there if there is an issue with the code, there could be big problems. Governance and the ability to fix problems. Now, this is something that concerns me a little bit more. With the removal of middlemen, we need to ensure that there's a system in place to fix issues and address problems as soon as possible. Without a central authority, who can fix something? If something gets posted to the permanent ledger and it's incorrect or wrong or needs to be fixed, how do you fix that? Most systems don't have a way where validators can get together and be like, oh yeah, maybe we should pull that off the blockchain or maybe we should fix that later. Uh, there, that's just something that, a hiccup that needs to be addressed you know, for certain problems because once it's on the blockchain, once it's executed, it's executed. It's very black and white. And then we have systematic risk, which is basically everything could come crumbling down if everyone just decided to start liquidating all of their assets involved in DeFi. However, again, this is also the case with anything that uses the network effect. You could think of the same problem for something like iMessage. iMessage is useful because so many people have it and use it. If everyone stopped using iMessage, there goes the benefit of using iMessage. Same goes with any social media site. It's no different for this. There's some systematic risk there. So there you have it, DeFi. This is something that is extremely excited to me and something that I just look forward to digging into more and more. I hope that this helped illuminate how amazing this technology will be once it's fully established in the coming years. Now, it could be a while before that happens, but it's exciting nevertheless, and we're only at the beginning as of right now. So I would like to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a profitable day.